Good day, ENG 1P1, Ms. Boschkoff here. We're gonna finish up our study today of the novel study, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. We are headed into section number six, which includes chapters 26 to 30. But first, before we dive right into the reading and the read aloud, um, let's take a look at the chapter questions. Now again, this is a time-saving strategy. We're gonna try to remember to do this next year when you're writing the literacy test. If you just take a moment or two to read the questions before you dive into the reading of the text, it is a time-saving strategy because it helps you uh, be aware of the answers when you encounter them in the text. All right, so just a few questions here. The first one, why is the chapter title humorous? Provide specific proof from the text. Now remember, we said if there are two questions, the first question is your answer, and the second question could be your extension. Now this is not a question, it's just simply telling you to provide proof for the P part. So essentially, we just have one question here. Why is the chapter title humorous? And again, the chapter title is, Rowdy and I have a long and serious discussion about basketball. So something is going to be funny or humorous about this. And we'll take a look at that when we dive into the reading. Now, again, there isn't a second question. So you need to provide your own extension. And again, the extension part is explain a little more sum it up in some kind of succinct way. Chapter 27, because Russian guys are not always geniuses. Question one, what happens to Mary? Now remember, Mary is Junior Arnold's sister. And then there is a second question here. What are the reasons this happens? So we can take the first question and use that to answer um, and then provide two quotes or reasons for support or details. Then you're gonna take the second question and use it as your extension. What are the reasons this happens? And again, you don't have to come up with your own extension because there is a second question. You can just use that as your extension. Chapter 28, my final freshman year report card. Describe Junior's report card. So again, there's just one question here or one thing you need to do, and you're gonna answer that in the A part, answer. Again, you're gonna answer the question by taking part of the question and putting it in your answer. Describe Junior's report card. Junior's report card was, again, using the exact same language in the question. Again, this is a strategy you're going to use when you're answering questions on the literacy test for the short answers. Again, you're gonna to try to go ahead and provide at least two quotes that prove your answer. And again, there is no second question here, so you're gonna come up with your own extension. You're going to explain a little bit more here. Chapter 29, Remembering. Why is this chapter entitled Remembering? What realizations does Junior arrive at? So again, here we have two questions. The first question, can be our A, can be our answer. Again, you're gonna take part of the question and put it in your answer. Why is this chapter titled uh, Remembering or entitled Remembering? This chapter is entitled Remembering Because, and then you're gonna answer it with a, a quote or two for support. You can take the second question and use it as your extension. The realization that Junior arrives at is, Chapter 30, here's our last question. Quote, we didn't keep score. What does the final line signify? So again, there is only one question here. That means you're gonna have to come up with your own extension because there isn't a second question. But again, you're gonna take part of the question and you're gonna put it in your answer. The final line, we didn't keep score, signifies that. And then you're gonna put your answer here. Right, this is the answer part. You're gonna put two reasons here or two quotes that support that. And then you're going to explain a little bit more here in your extension. Now remember on the literacy test, the short answers, the short paragraphs are worth 30 marks. Essentially, you could say 10 marks for your answer, 10 marks for the prove, and 10 marks for your extension.
All right, let's dive right into our study of the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian. We're going to continue going here with chapter 26, which again is the beginning of uh, section, uh, section six. And again, this is going to take us to the very end of our novel study. A few days after basketball season ended, I emailed Rowdy and told him I was sorry that we beat them so bad and that their season went to hell after that. So again, one of the questions, the first question is, what is so humorous about this title? Rowdy and I have a long and serious discussion about basketball. So I guess one question we could ask is, is the discussion really long and serious? And is it about basketball? Because if it isn't, then that would be kind of funny. So again, remember at the end of chapter 25, Junior or Arnold was feeling quite ashamed of the fact that he so badly wanted to get revenge on his old teammates at Will Pennant. And then he realizes, of course, that that things are not equal between the Reardon team and the Will Pennant team, right? So he's feeling badly, he's feeling ashamed, and that prompts him to start crying. He was crying because he had broken his best friend's heart. Yeah. All right, so he's feeling so badly that he ends up emailing Rowdy. I told him I was sorry that we beat them so bad and that their season went to hell after that. We'll kick your asses next year, Rowdy wrote back. And you'll cry like the little faggot you are. I might be a faggot, I wrote back, but I'm the faggot who beat you. Ha ha, Rowdy wrote. Now that might seem like a series of homophobic. Well, we're going to continue here, but I do want to just address this, this point here. Again, there are some people that believe this novel should be censored, that certain words and details should be left out. Now, again, I just want to bring to mind the fact that this, the title of the novel is The Absolutely True Diary. It's not the absolutely sanitized or cleaned up version or, you know, politically correct version um, of, you know, the diary of a, a teenage um um, but here, what is it again? The absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian, right? So it's not the sanitized version of a diary of a part-time Indian. It's the absolutely true. So would, is this absolutely true that two old best friends that hate each other might call each other this? It is absolutely true. Is it correct or is it justified or is it okay? Absolutely not. Um, so the fact that it's in this book does not mean that the teachers or the school are supporting the use of this language toward each other. All that it's suggesting is that for some people, this might be the language that they absolutely and truly use. Not that it's okay to do that because it for sure is not. Now that might sound, just sound like a series of homophobic insults. But I think it was also a little bit friendly. And it was the first time that Rowdy had talked to me since I left the res. I was a happy faggot. So again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting this is a good language to use, that it's okay to use, that it's justified to use. But for some reason, the author believed that this is the language that two teenage boys would probably or likely use. Uh, when addressing each other under this circumstance. All right, now let's take a look at the title here. This is actually a really short discussion, um, and it's not entirely about basketball, um, but it's somewhat. The deal here is, though, it is not long and serious, right? So what's humorous about this title? Well, the, what's humorous about it is that it's not funny at all. It's not long and it's not serious. So the title is actually funny. It's misleading because you think they're gonna have this big, deep, serious conversation when in fact, it's only a couple of sentences long, right? But I guess the point that Junior's trying to make here is that at least Rowdy talked to him since he left the res. Okay, let's keep going here. Chapter 27, because Russian guys are not always geniuses. After my grandmother died, I felt like crawling into the coffin with her. 
after my bet, my dad's best friend got shot in the face, Eugene, I wondered if I was destined to get shot in the face too. Considering how many young Spokans have died in car wrecks, I'm pretty sure it's my destiny to die in a wreck too. Jeez, I've been to so many funerals in my short life. I'm 14 years old and I've been to 42 funerals. This is an insane statistic. Um, I'm in my 50s and I think I've only gone to four funerals in my life. The fact that this kid here is 14 years old and has experienced this much death, and not just death from old age, but tragic, tragic death, like death that spins you into PTSD, right, into post-traumatic stress disorder. It's, it's a wonder that he is able to even function having attended this many funerals. That's really the biggest difference between Indians and white people, for sure. A few of my white classmates have been to a grandparent's funeral and a few have lost an uncle or aunt and one guy's brother died of leukemia when he was in third grade. But there's nobody who has been to more than five funerals, including me. All my white friends can count their deaths on one hand. I can count my fingers, toes, arms, legs, eyes, ears, nose, penis, butt cheeks, and nipples and still not get close. To my deaths. And you know what the worst part is? The unhappy part? About 90% of the deaths have been because of alcohol. That's pretty sad. Gordy gave me this book by a Russian dude named Tolstoy who wrote this quote, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Well, I hate to argue with a Russian genius, but Tolstoy didn't know Indians. And he didn't know that all Indian families are unhappy for the same exact reason. The frickin' booze. Yep. So let me pour a drink for Tolstoy and let him think hard about the true definition of unhappy families. So okay, you're probably thinking, I'm being extra bitter. And I would have to agree with you. I am being extra bitter. So let me tell you why. Today, around 9 a.m., as I sat in chemistry, there was a knock at the door, and Miss Warren, the guidance counselor, stepped into the room. Dr. Noble, the chemistry teacher, hates being interrupted. So he gave the old stink eye to Miss Warren. <clears throat> Can I help you, Miss Warren? Dr. Noble asked, except he made it sound like an insult. Yes, she said. May I speak to Arnold in private? Um, can this wait? We're going to have a quiz in a few moments. I need to speak with him now, please. So obviously there's some kind of an emergency. It can't wait. Fine. Arnold, please go with Miss Warren. I gathered up my books and followed Miss Warren out into the hallway. I was a little worried. I wondered if I'd done something wrong. I couldn't think of anything I'd done that would merit punishment, but I was still worried. I didn't want to get into any kind of trouble. What's going on, Miss Warren? I asked. She started, she suddenly started crying, weeping. Just these big old whooping tears. I, I thought she was gonna fall over on the floor, just start screaming and kicking like a two-year-old. Jeez, Miss Warren, what is it? What's wrong? She hugged me hard. And I have to admit that it felt pretty dang good. Miss Warren was like 50 years old, but she was still pretty hot. She was all skinny and muscular because she jogged all the time. So I sort of er, physically reacted to her hug. And the thing is, Miss Warren was hugging me so tight that I was pretty sure she could feel my er, physical reaction. I was kind of proud, you know. Arnold, I'm sorry, she said, but I just got a phone call from your mother. It's your sister. She's passed away. What do you mean? I asked. 
I knew what she meant, but I wanted her to say something else, anything else. Your sister is gone, Miss Warren said. I know she's gone, I said. She lives in Montana now. I knew I was being an idiot, but I figured if I kept being an idiot, if I didn't actually accept the truth, then the truth would become false. No, Miss Warren said. Your sister? She's dead. That was it. I couldn't fake my way around that. Dead is dead. I was stunned, but I wasn't sad. The grief didn't hit me right away. No, I was mostly ashamed of my er, physical reaction to the hug. Yep, I had a big erection when I learned of my sister's death. How perverted is that? How inappropriately hormonal can one boy be? How did she die? I asked. Your father is coming to get you, Miss Warren said. He'll be here in a few minutes. You can wait in my office. How did she die? I asked again. Your father is coming to get you, Miss Warren said again. I knew that she didn't want to tell me how my sister had died. I figured it must have been an awful death. Was she murdered? I asked. Your father is coming. Man! Miss Warren was a lame counselor. She didn't know what to say to me. But then again, couldn't really blame her. She never counseled a student whose sibling, whose sibling had just died. Was my sister murdered? I asked. Please, Miss Warren said. You need to talk to your father. She looked so sad that I let it go. Well, I mostly let it go. I certainly didn't want to wait in her office. The guidance office was filled with self-help books and inspirational posters and SAT test books and college brochures and scholarship applications. And I knew that none of that, absolutely none of it meant shit. I knew I'd probably tear her office apart if I had to wait there. Miss Warren, I said, I wanna wait outside. But it's snowing, she said. Well, that would make it perfect, then wouldn't it? It was a rhetorical question, meaning there wasn't supposed to be an answer, right? But poor Miss Warren, Warren, she answered my rhetorical question. No, I don't think it's a good idea to wait in the snow, she said. You're very vulnerable right now. Vulnerable? She told me I was vulnerable? My big sister was dead. Of course I was vulnerable. Vulnerable means at risk. I was a reservation Indian attending an all-white school and my sister had just died some horrible death. I was the most vulnerable kid in the United States. Miss Warren was obviously trying to win the Captain Obvious Award. I'm waiting outside, I said. I'll wait with you, she said. Kiss my ass. I said and ran. Miss Warren tried to run after me, but she was wearing heels and she was crying and she was absolutely freaked out by my reaction to the bad news, by my cursing. She was nice, too nice to deal with death. So she ran a few feet before she stopped and slumped, slumped against the wall. I ran by my locker, grabbed my coat and headed outside. There was maybe a foot of snow on the ground already. It was going to be a big storm. I suddenly worried that my father was going to wreck his car on the icy roads. Oh man, wouldn't that just be perfect? Yep, how Indian would that be? Imagine the stories I could tell. Yeah, when I was a kid, just after I learned that my big sister died, I found out that my father died in a car wreck on the way to pick me up from school. I was absolutely terrified as I waited. I prayed to God that my father would come driving up in his old car. Please, God, please don't kill my daddy. Please, God, please don't kill my daddy. Please, God, please don't kill my daddy. 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes went by. I was freezing. 
My hands and feet were big blocks of ice. Snot ran down my face. My ears were burning cold. Oh, daddy, please. Oh, daddy, please. Oh, daddy, please. Oh, man. I was absolutely convinced that my father was dead, too. It had been too long. He'd driven his car off a cliff and had drowned in the Spokane River. Or he'd lost control, slid across the center line, and spun right into the path of a logging truck. Daddy, 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 daddy. And just when I thought I'd start screaming and run around like a crazy man, my father drove up. I started laughing. I was so relieved, so happy that I laughed and I couldn't stop laughing. And again, this whole idea of laughing when we don't know how to react, it's its almost like a, a, a normal, abnormal reaction to trauma. We're not really sure how to react. And so sometimes we do start laughing at things that are just completely inappropriate to laugh at. I ran down the hill, jumped into the car, and hugged my dad. I laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. Junior, he said, what's wrong with you? You're alive, I shouted, you're alive. But your sister, he said. I know, I know, I said, she's dead. But you're alive, you're still alive. I laughed and laughed. I couldn't stop laughing. I felt like I might die of laughing. So again, here's his comic, son, you're freaking me out now. I couldn't figure out why I was laughing, but I kept laughing as my dad drove out of Reardon and headed through the storm back to the reservation. And then, finally, as we crossed the reservation border, I stopped laughing. How did she die? I asked. There was a big party at her house. Her trailer in Montana? All right, so one of the questions in the study package asks, how did she die? What happened to her? She died, but how did she die? So here's our, um, our proof. There was a big party at her house, her trailer in Montana, he said. Yep, my sister and her husband lived in some old silver trailer that was more like a TV dinner tray than a home. They had a big party, my father said. Of course they had a big party, of course. They were drunk. They're Indians. They had a big party, my father said, and your sister and her husband passed out in the back room and somebody tried to cook some soup on a hot plate and they forgot about it and left. And a curtain drifted in on the wind and caught the hot plate and the trailer burned down quick. I swear to you that I could hear my sister screaming. The police say your sister never even woke up, my father said. She was way too drunk. My, dra my dad was trying to comfort me, but it's not too comforting to learn that your sister was too freaking drunk to feel any pain when she burned to death. And for some reason, that thought made me laugh even harder. I was laughing so hard that I threw up a little bit in my mouth. I spit out a little piece of cantaloupe, which was weird because I don't like cantaloupe. I've hated cantaloupe since I was a little kid. I couldn't remember the last time I'd eaten the evil fruit. And then <laughs> I remembered that my sister had always loved cantaloupe. Ain't that weird? It was, it was so freaky that I laughed even harder than I'd already been laughing. I started pounding the dashboard and stomping on the floor. I was going absolutely insane with laughter. My dad didn't say a word. He just stared straight ahead and drove home. I laughed the whole way. Well, I laughed until we were about halfway home and then I fell asleep. Snap, just like that. Things had gotten so intense, so painful that my body just checked out. Yep, my mind and soul and heart had a quick meeting and voted to shut down for a few repairs. And guess what? I dreamed about cantaloupe. Well, I dreamed about a school picnic. I went to way back when I was seven years old. There were hot dogs and hamburgers and soda pop and potato chips and watermelon and cantaloupe. 
I ate like seven pieces of cantaloupe. My, face, my hands and face were way sticky and sweet. I'd eaten so much cantaloupe that I turned into a cantaloupe. Well, I finished my lunch and ran around the playground laughing and screaming when I felt this tickle on my cheek. I reached up to find my face, to scratch my face, and squished the wasp that had been sucking sugar off my cheek. Have you ever been stung in the face? Well, I have, and that's why I hate cantaloupe. So I woke up from this dream, this nightmare, just as my dad drove the car up to our house. We're here, he said. My sister is dead, I said. Yes. I was hoping I dreamed that, I said. Me too, his dad said. I dreamed about the time I got stung by the wasp, I said. I remember that, Dad said. We had to take you to the hospital. I thought I was going to die. We were scared too. My dad started crying. Not big tears, just little ones. He breathed deep and tried to stop them. I guess he wanted to try to be strong in front of his son. But it didn't work. He kept crying. I didn't cry. I reached out, wiped the tears off my father's face, and tasted them. Salty. I love you, he said. Wow. He hardly ever said that to me. I love you too, I said. I never said that to him. We walked into the house. My mom was curled into a ball on the couch. There were like 25 or 30 cousins there eating all of our food. Somebody dies and people eat your food. Funny how that works. Mom, I said. Oh, Junior, she said and pulled me onto the couch with her. I'm sorry, Mom. I'm so sorry. Don't leave me, she said. Don't ever leave me. Okay, so the, the mother's reaction here is, I think, pretty typical. She has two kids. She's just lost one of them. And she is probably mentally and emotionally terrified to lose the other one, right? So she's like, don't leave me. Don't you ever leave me. She was freaking out. But who could blame her? She lost her mother, her daughter in just a few months. Who ever recovers from a thing like that? Whoever gets better. Um, I knew that my mother was now broken and that she'd always be broken. And this is interesting because, of course, if Junior, if Arnold at 14 has gone to 42 funerals, it makes you wonder how much, how many funerals his parents have been to. Don't you ever drink, my mother said to me. She slapped me once, twice, three times. She slapped me hard. Promise me you'll never drink. Okay, okay, I promise, I said. I couldn't believe it. My sister killed herself with booze and I was the one getting slapped. Huh. Where was Leo Tolstoy when I needed him? I kept wishing he'd show up so my mother could slap him instead. Well, my mother quit slapping me, thank God. But she held on to me for hours. Held on to me like I was a baby. And she just kept crying. So many tears. My clothes and hair were soaked with her tears. It was like my mother had given me a grief shower, you know? Like she baptized me with her pain. Of course, it was way too weird to watch. So all of my cousins left. My dad went in his bedroom. It was just my mother and me, just her tears and me. But I didn't cry. I just hugged my mother back and wanted all of it to be over. I wanted to fall asleep again and dream about killer wasps because anything was better than, you know, the hell he was actually going through. Yeah, I figured any nightmare would be better than my reality. And then it was over. My mother fell asleep and let me go. I stood and walked into the kitchen. I was way hungry, but my cousins had eaten most of our food. 
So all I had for dinner were saltine crackers and water. Like I was in jail. Yeah, like he's trapped in some terrible jail cell that he can't get out of, right? The fact that he did not cry is pretty important. It might uh, signify that he is in PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Often what happens when people experience a lot of trauma that is too difficult for them to, to deal with at the time, they go into a state of feeling nothing, feeling numb. And for some people, if they keep experiencing this trauma over and over and over again and never really get a chance to come out of this numbness, they experience chronic and potentially, you know, life-long la lasting um, depression, right? So he is quite likely in PTSD. So he's, he's numb. He can't, he can't feel anything. I didn't cry. Man. Two days later, we buried my sister in the Catholic graveyard down near the powwow ground. I barely remember the wake. I barely remember the funeral service. I barely remember the the burial it was in this weird fog. Okay, again, PTSD, it sounds very much like what he's going through signifies he is in post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, the fact that he's in a fog, he can't think clearly, he can't remember things, he doesn't feel anything, all of that is the result of trauma. No, it was more like I was in this small room, the smallest room in the world. I could reach out and touch the walls, which were made of greasy glass. I could see the shadows, but I couldn't see details, you know? Like everything was foggy. And I was cold, just freezing. Like there was a snowstorm blowing inside of my chest. But all that fog and greasy glass and snow disappeared when they lowered my sister's coffin into the grave. And let me tell you... It had taken them forever to dig that grave in the frozen ground. As the coffin settled into the dirt, it made this noise, almost like a breath, you know, like a sigh. Like the coffin was settling down for a long, long nap, for a forever nap. That was it. I had to get out of there. I turned and ran out of the graveyard and into the woods across the road. I planned on running deep into the woods, so deep that I'd never be found. It was just too much pain for him to, to acknowledge, right? So he needed to run away, to try to run away from this pain. Um, but guess what? I ran full speed into Rowdy, and it sent us both sprawling. Yep, Rowdy had been hiding in the woods while he watched the burial. Wow. Rowdy sat up, and I sat up too. We just sat there together. Rowdy was crying. His face was shiny with tears. Rowdy, I said, you're crying. I ain't crying, he said. You're crying. I touched my face. It was dry. No tears yet. Still, he's in this PTSD, right? I can't remember how to cry, I said. That made Rody, Rowdy sort of choke. He gasped a little and more tears rolled down his face. You're crying, I said. No, I'm not. It, it's okay. I miss my sister too. I love her. I said, I'm not crying. It's okay. I reached out and touched Rowdy's shoulder. A big mistake. Yep, he punched me. Well, he almost punched me. He threw a punch, but he missed. Rowdy actually missed a punch. His fist went sailing over my head. Wow, I said, you missed. I missed on purpose. No, you didn't. You missed because your eyes are filled with tears. And that made me laugh. Yep. I started laughing like a crazy man again. I rolled around on the cold, frozen ground and laughed and laughed and laughed. I didn't want to laugh. I wanted to stop laughing. I wanted to grab Rowdy and hang on to him. He was my best friend and I needed him. 
but I couldn't stop laughing. I looked at Rowdy and he was crying hard now. He thought I was laughing at him. Normally, Rowdy would have murdered anyone who dared to laugh at him, but this was not a normal day. Yeah, this is not business as usual. It's all your fault, he said. What's my fault? Your sister's dead because you left us. You killed her. That made me stop laughing. I suddenly felt like I might never laugh again. Rowdy was right. I had killed my sister. My sister. Well, I didn't kill her. But she only got married so quickly and left the res because I had left the res first. She was only living in Montana in a cheap trailer because I had gone to school in Reardon. She had burned to death because I had decided that I wanted to spend my life with white people. It was all my fault. Now this, of course, this way of thinking doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. That doesn't make any sense. Of course, um, Junior Arnold is not responsible for the death of his sister. Absolutely not. But when we are in a state of post-traumatic stress, we do not make sense. We don't, um, we don't think clearly. We're in a fog. Our, our emotions are out of whack. We don't think clearly. It is, of course, not his fault. I hate you, Rowdy screamed. I hate you, I hate you. And they jumped up and ran away. Rowdy ran. He'd never run away from anything or anybody, but now he was running. I watched him disappear into the woods. I wondered if I'd ever see him again. The next morning, I went to school. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't want to sit at home all day and talk to a million cousins. I knew my mother would be cooking food for everybody and that my father would be hiding out in his bedroom again. And this is interesting because... Um, typically what our white culture does is we take at least two weeks to mourn and to kind of deal with our emotions. But I have noticed that some indigenous kids do come to school right after, like right after experiencing a terrible trauma. It makes you wonder why coming to school is better than staying at home, right? Or maybe like Arnold here, they just didn't know what else to do. I knew everybody else or everybody would tell stories about Mary and the whole time I'd be thinking, yeah, but have you ever heard the story about how I killed my sister when I left the res? So he's feeling guilty here. But again, this is not reasonable. This isn't, this doesn't make any sense. He did not kill his sister. And the whole time, everybody would be drinking booze and getting drunk and stupid and sad and mean. Yeah. Doesn't that make sense? How do we honor the drunken death of a young married couple? Hey, let's get drunk. Okay, listen, I'm not a cruel bastard, okay? I know that people were very sad. I know that my sister's death made everybody remember all the deaths in their life. I know that death is never added to death. It multiplies. But still, I couldn't stay and watch all those people get drunk. I couldn't do it. If you give me a room full of sober Indians crying and laughing and telling stories about my sister, then I would have gladly stayed and joined them in the ceremony. But everybody was drunk. Everybody was unhappy. And they were drunk and unhappy in the same exact way. So I fled my house and then went to school. I walked through the snow for a few miles until a white BIA worker picked me up and delivered me to the front door. I walked inside into the crowded hallways and all sorts of boys and girls and teachers came up to me and hugged me and slapped my shoulder and gave me little punches in the belly. They were worried for me. They wanted to help me with my pain. I was important to them. I mattered. Wow. So when Mr. P suggested he go to the white school and go someplace where there's hope, he, he is going someplace where there's hope. He's going to school. Is there hope here in his home when people are drunk and just full of unhappiness? Not much hope here. And so Junior had to make the decision to go someplace where there was hope and real support for him. 
not just a bunch of drunk people. All of these white kids and teachers who were so suspicious of me when I first arrived had learned to care about me. Maybe some of them even loved me and I'd been so suspicious of them. And now I care a lot of them, about a lot of them and loved a few of them. Penelope came up to me last. She was weeping. Snot ran down her face and it was still sort of sexy. I'm so sorry about your sister, she said. I didn't know what to say to her. What do you say to people when they ask you how it feels to lose everything? When every planet in your solar system has exploded. So again, this quote right here at the end makes us realize that his whole, not just his world, but his whole solar system, the universe, has exploded. It feels like he's lost absolutely everything. All right. Chapter 28, my final freshman year report card. Mr. Arnold Spirit, Jr., Esquire, Ph.D., Rear, Dumb, and Sci School. Reardon. Rear, rear dumb and high school. Um, final report card. Okay, in English, you got an A. Geology, B+, plus, geometry, A, history, A-, minus, phys ed, A, computer programming, A, and let's make birdhouses, woodshop, B-. minus. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So did he have a successful year? Yeah, one of the questions on the study guide asks um, about his report card. So what about his report card? Regardless of all of the people dying and all of the tragedy in his life, this kid still managed to get some good marks here. It's actually absolutely astounding to me as a teacher that he could, you know, still even attend school. All right, chapter 29, Remembering. So again, the question in the study guide is, why is this chapter called Remembering? Today... My mother, father, and I went to the cemetery and cleaned graves. We took care of Grandmother Spirit, Eugene, and Mary. Mom had packed a picnic and Dad brought his saxophone, so we made a whole day of it. We Indians know how to celebrate with our dead. And I felt okay. My mother and father held hands and kissed each other. You can't make out in a graveyard, I said. Love and death, my father said. It's all love and death. You're crazy, I said. I'm crazy about you, he said, and he hugged me. And he hugged my mother, and she had tears in her eyes, and she held my face in her hands. Now, this is important up here because it's, it's almost like losing his daughter has made the father realize um how he needs to reach out more to his son, right? Like the fact I'm crazy about you and he hugs him. And the father previous to that had um, not been able to say I love you or to be super affectionate. So it looks like some things are changing. People are growing and learning um, about priorities in their life, right? The father's realizing what a priority his relationship is with his son. Okay, so the mother, she held my face in her hands. Junior, she said, I'm so proud of you. That was the best thing she could have said. In the middle of a crazy and drunk life, you have to hang on to the good and sober moments tightly. I was happy. I, I still miss my sister and no amount of love and trust was going to make that better. I love her. I will always love her. I mean, she was amazing. It was courageous of her to leave the basement and move to Montana. She went searching for her dreams and she didn't find them, but she made the attempt and I was making the attempt too. And maybe it wouldn't, maybe it would kill me too, but I knew that staying on the res would have killed me too. It all made me cry for my sister. It made me cry for myself, but I was crying for my tribe too. I was crying because I knew five or 10 or 15 more Spokans would die during the next year and that most of them would die because of the booze. It's pretty sad. Um, in some reservations, of course, 
it's not just the booze, right? It has to do with um, some hard drugs as well. And even softer drugs. Again, so much sadness and trauma that people are just trying to numb themselves from all the pain. And on some level, I understand that completely, right? I cried because so many of my fellow tribal members were slowly killing themselves. And I wanted them to live. I wanted them to get strong and get sober and get the hell off the res. It's a weird thing. Reservations were meant to be prisons, you know. Indians were supposed to move onto reservations and die. We were supposed to disappear. But somehow or another, Indians have forgotten that reservations were meant to be death camps. I wept because I was the only one who was brave and crazy enough to leave the res. I was the only one with enough arrogance. I wept and wept and wept because I knew that I was never going to drink and because I was never going to kill myself and because I was going to have a better life out in the white world. So he is crying here. So he's come out of his PTSD, some of his depression that he was in. He's able to feel some things now. He's less numb. But he's certainly realizing some really important things. That if he wants to have a good life, he's got to make, you know, it a priority. He, he, he can't drink and he can, you know, cannot commit suicide, obviously. I realized that I might be a lonely Indian boy, but I was not alone in my loneliness. There were millions of other Americans who had left their birthplaces in search of a dream. And of course, he's talking about the great American dream and how so many immigrants came from other places and how they made it. Yeah. But he is in search of a dream too, like an immigrant. Um, and he's not going to give up. I realized that, sure, I was a Spokane Indian. I belonged to that tribe. But I also belong to the tribe of American immigrants. Yeah, so he is like an immigrant. And to the tribe of basketball players. And to the tribe of bookworms. And the tribe of cartoonists. And the tribe of chronic masturbators. And again, some parents take offense. And some educators take offense to the shock value of statements like this. But again, this is supposed to be the absolutely true diary. And our young teenage teenage uh, boys very you know hormonal and full of testosterone you bet they are and the tribe of teenage boys and the tribe of small town kids and the tribe of pacific northwesterners and the tribe of tortilla chips and salsa lovers and the tribe of poverty the tribe of funeral goers and the tribe of beloved sons and the tribe of boys who really miss their best friends it was a huge realization and that's when I knew I was going to be okay. So he's thinking back and he's realizing that he belongs to a bunch of different groups. And because he belongs to all these different groups, some of them are sad and some of them are hopeful. <clears throat> but that he, he's going to be okay regardless. But it also reminded me of the people who were not going to be okay. It made me think of Rowdy. I missed him so much. I wanted to find him and hug him and beg him to forgive me for leaving. Boys can hold hands only until they turn nine. Me and Rowdy in the third grade jumping into Turtle Lake. Okay, so this is an important thing to note because the last chapters here are, are going to talk about this Turtle Lake. Okay, so this is, of course, when they were in the third grade. They were nine years old. <clears throat> so why is this called remembering? Well... I think because he is remembering a bunch of really important things, right? Chapter 30, talking about turtles. Okay, so this is Turtle Lake. I wonder if this chapter is going to talk about turtles or this Turtle Lake. Now remember, in the indigenous culture, um, the people believe that the turtle is uh, responsible for the creation of, I think, North America, for, for the land. The reservation is beautiful. I mean it. Take a look. There are pine trees everywhere. Thousands of ponderosa pine trees. Millions. 
I guess maybe you can take pine trees for granted. They're just pine trees, but they're tall and thin and green and brown and big. Some of the pines are 90 feet tall and more than 300 years old. Yeah, beautiful. When you get out in nature and you really take the time or take the opportunity to look at how miraculous it all is and, you know, and, and, and use all your five senses to experience it, it is pretty darn beautiful. So some of these trees were older than the country itself of the United States. Some of them were alive when Abraham Lincoln was president. Some of them were alive when George Washington was president. Some of those trees were alive when Benjamin Franklin was born. I'm talking old. I've probably climbed like 100 different trees in my lifetime. There are 12 in my backyard, another 50 or 60 in the small stand of woods across the field, and another 20 or 30 around our little town, and, in a, f and a few way out in the deep woods. And that tall monster that sits beside the highway to West End, past Turtle Lake, so he's talking about one specific super tall um, tree just past Turtle Lake. That one is way over 100 feet tall. It might be 150 feet tall. You could build a house using just the wood from that one tree. That is a humongously large tree. When we were little, like 10 years old, Rowdy and I climbed that sucker. So he's still remembering here so the past. It was probably stupid. Yeah, okay, it was stupid. It's not like we were lumberjacks or anything. It's not like we uh, used anything except our hands, feet, and dumb luck. But we weren't afraid of falling that day. Other days, other days, yeah, I'm terrified of falling. No matter how old I get, I think I'm always going to be scared of falling. But I wasn't scared of gravity on that day. Heck, gravity didn't even exist. It was July, crazy hot and dry. It hadn't rained in like 60 days. Okay, so they're going through a real drought. Um, scorpion hot. Vultures flying circles in the, sky, in the sky hot. Mostly, Rowdy and I just sat in my basement room, which was maybe five degrees cooler than the rest of the house, and read books and watched TV and played video games. So again, he's remembering back to them when they were 10 years old. Mostly, Rowdy and I just sat still and dreamed about air conditioning. When I get rich and famous, Rowdy said, I'm going to have a house that has an air conditioner in every room. So again, this is how poor they were growing up, right? Um, many, many people in our society today have air conditioners, um, built-in air conditioners in their houses, in their cars, in the workplaces. It shows, again here, how poor they really are. Sears has those big air conditioners that can cool a whole house, I said. Just one machine? Rowdy asked. Yeah, you put it outside and you connect it through the air vents and stuff. Wow, how much does that cost? Like a few thousand bucks, I think. I'll never have that much money. You will when you play in the NBA. Yeah, but I'll probably have to play pro basketball in like Sweden or Norway or Russia or something. And I won't need air conditioning. I'll probably live in like an igloo or own reindeer or something. You're going to play for Seattle, man. Yeah, right. Rowdy didn't believe in himself. Not much. So I tried to pump him up. You're the toughest kid on the res, I said. And I know, he said. You're the fastest, the strongest, and the most handsome, too. If I had a dog with a face like yours, I'd shave its ass and teach it to walk backwards. I once had a zit that looked like you. Then I popped it, and then it looked even more like you. So they're having, um, like, a face-off here with, uh, with trying to disparage each other, right? Um, this one time, I ate, like, three hot dogs and a bowl of clam chowder, and then I got diarrhea all over the floor, and it looked like you. And then you ate it, Rowdy said. So yeah, they're trying to one-up each other, right? We laughed ourselves silly. We laughed ourselves sweaty. Don't make me laugh, I said. It's too hot to laugh. It's too hot to sit in this house. Let's go swimming.
Where? Turtle Lake. Okay, I said. But I was scared of Turtle Lake. It was a small body of water, maybe only a mile around, maybe less, but it was deep, like crazy deep. Nobody has ever been to the bottom of it. I'm not a very good swimmer, so I was always afraid I'd sink and drown, and they'd never, ever find my body. One year, these scientists came with a mini submarine and tried to find the bottom, but the lake was so silty and muddy that they couldn't see. And the nearby, the nearby uranium mine made their radar sonar machines go nuts, so they couldn't see that way either. So they never made it to the bottom. So this lake, this turtle lake, is full of mystery. And it's scary, right? He's afraid he's going to drown in it. The lake is round, perfectly round. So the scientists said it was probably an ancient and dormant volcano crater. Yeah, a, a volcano on the res. The lake was so deep because the volcano crater and tunnels and lava chutes and all that plumbing went all the way down to the center of the earth. That lake was like forever deep. There were all sorts of myths and legends surrounding Turtle Lake. I mean, we're Indians and we like to make shit up about lakes, you know? Some people said the lake is named Turtle because it's round and green like a turtle's shell. Some people said it's Turtle because it used to be filled with regular turtles. Some people said it's named Turtle because it used to be home to this giant snapping turtle that ate Indians, like a Jurassic turtle, like a Steven Spielberg turtle, a King Kong versus the giant reservation turtle turtle. I didn't exactly believe in the giant turtle myth. I was too old and smart for that. But I'm still an Indian and we like to be scared. I don't know what it's about to us, what it is about us. We love ghosts, we love monsters. And I was really scared of this other story about Turtle Lake. My dad told me the story. Okay, so he's going to tell a story, like another story, something about Turtle Lake that really got him spooked out. My dad told me this story. When he was a kid, he watched a horse drown in Turtle Lake and disappear. Disappear because it's so deep, right? Some of the others say it was a giant turtle that grabbed the horse. Dad said, but they're lying. They were just being silly. That horse was just stupid. It was so stupid, we named it Stupid Horse. Well, Stupid Horse sank into the endless depths of Turtle Lake, and everybody figured that was the end of that story. But a few weeks later, Stupid Horse's body washed up on the shores of Benjamin Lake, like 10 miles away from Turtle Lake. Everybody just figured some joker had found the body and moved it, Dad said, to scare people. People laughed at the practical joke. Then a bunch of guys threw the dead horse into the, into the back of a truck, drove it to the dump, and burned it. A simple story, right? Nope, it doesn't end there. Well, a few weeks after they burned the body, a bunch of kids were swimming in Turtle Lake when it caught fire. Yes, the whole lake caught on fire. The kids were swimming close to the dock because the lake was so deep. Most kids swam, swam close to the shore. And the fire started out in the middle of the lake. So the kids were able to safely climb out of the water before it all went up like a big bowl of gasoline. It burned for a few hours, Dad said. Burned hot and fast. And then it went out just like that. People stayed away for a few days and then went to take a look at the damage, you know? And guess what they found? Stupid horse washed up on the shore again. Despite being burned at the dump and burned again in the lake of fire, stupid horse was untouched. Well, the horse was still dead, of course, but it was unburned. Nobody went near that horse after that. They just let it rot. But it took a long time, too long. For weeks, the dead body just lay there. Didn't go bad or anything, didn't stink. The bugs and animals stayed away. Only after a few weeks did Stupid Horse finally let go. His skin and flesh melted away. 
the maggots and coyotes ate their fill. Then the horse was just bones. Let me tell you, Dad said, that was just about the scariest thing I'd ever seen. That horse skeleton lying there. It was freaky. After a few more weeks, the skeleton collapsed into a pile of bones and the water and the wind dragged them away. It was a freaky story. Okay, so something about this story, about the, about the horse, has really stayed in uh, Junior's memory. He can't get it out. So because of this story and because of a bunch of other stories, swimming in Turtle Lake is kind of scary for him. Okay, so that's why he goes into detail about, you know, these myths and these stories to help us understand how scary Turtle Lake is for him. It's mysterious, but it's scary. Nobody swam in Turtle Lake for like 10, 11 years, Dad said. It was too freaky. Me? I don't think anybody should be swimming in there now. But people forget. They forget good things and they forget bad things. They forget that lakes can catch on fire. They forget that dead horses can magically vanish and reappear. I mean, geez, we Indians are just weird. So anyway, on that hot summer day, Rowdy and I walked the five miles from my house to Turtle Lake. All the way, I thought about the fire and horses. And I wasn't going to tell Rowdy about that. He would have just called me a wuss or a pussy. He would have just said it was kid stuff. He would have just said it was a hot day that needed that needed a cold lake. As we watched, sorry, as we walked, I saw that monster pine tree ahead of us. It was so tall and green and beautiful. It was the only reservation skyscraper, you know? I love that tree, I said. That's because you're a tree fag, Rowdy said. I'm not a tree fag. And how come you like to stick your dick inside knot holes? I stick my dick in the girl trees, I said. Rowdy laughed, his ha-ha-he-he -he avalanche laugh. I love to make him laugh. I was the only one who knew how to make him laugh. So again, some, some parents and teachers find this conversation here um, offensive or at the very least inappropriate. Um, but certainly by the time you are a teenage boy, by the time you are in high school, um, and by grade nine, of course, by the time you're reading this novel, this kind of conversation might actually reflect an absolutely true conversation you might have with your best friend. Again, not that I'm okay with it, not that I think it's all right, not that I think it's appropriate, but is it absolutely true? It, it, it might be. Um... I loved to make him laugh. I was the only one who knew how to make him laugh. Hey, he said, you know what we should do? I hated when Rowdy asked that particular question. It meant we were about to do something dangerous. What should we do? I asked. We should climb that monster. That tree? No, we should climb your big head, he said. Of course I'm talking about that tree, the biggest tree on the res. It wasn't really open to debate. I had to climb the tree. Rowdy knew I had to climb the tree with him. I couldn't back down. That wasn't how our friendship worked. We're gonna die, I said. Eh, probably, Rowdy said. So we walked over to the tree and looked up. It was way tall. I got dizzy. Yeah, he got dizzy just looking at it because it's so tall. You first, Rowdy said. I spit on my hands, rubbed them together and reached up for the first branch. I pulled myself up to the next branch, and then the next, and then the next, and the next. Rowdy followed me. Branch by branch, Rowdy and I climbed toward the top of the tree, to the bottom of the sky. Near the top, the branches got thinner and thinner. I wondered if they'd support our weight. I kept expecting one of them to snap and send me plummeting to my death. But it didn't happen. The branches would not break. Rowdy and I climbed and climbed and climbed. We made it to the top, well, almost to the top. Even Rowdy was too scared to step on the thinnest branches. So we made it within 10 feet of the top. Not the summit, but close enough to call it the summit. 
We clung tightly to the tree as it swung in the breeze. Like, this would be terrifying for me. And of course, he was scared. I was scared, sure, terrified. But it was also fun, you know? We were more than 100 feet in the air from our vantage point. We could see for miles. We could see from one end of the reservation to the other. We could see our entire world. And our entire world at that moment was green and golden and perfect. Wow, I said. It's pretty, Rowdy said. I've never seen anything so pretty. It was the only time I'd ever heard him talk like that. We stayed in the top of that tree for like an hour or two. We didn't want to leave. I thought maybe we'd stay up there and die. I thought maybe 200 years later, scientists would find two boy skeletons stuck in the top of that tree. But Rowdy broke the spell. He farted. A greasy one. A greasy, smelly one that sounded like it was half solid. Jeez, I said. I think you just killed the tree. We laughed. And then we climbed down. I don't know if anybody else has ever climbed that tree. I look at it now years later, and I can't believe we did it. And I can't believe I survived my first year at Reardon. So again, he's making connection here between his present and his past. In the past, he did do things that were scary, and he survived. And in his present, he just did the same thing, something really scary, and he survived. After the last day of school ended, I didn't do much. It was summer. I wasn't supposed to do anything. I mostly sat in my room and read comics. I missed my white friends and my white teachers and my translucent semi-girlfriend. Ah, Penelope. I hoped she was thinking about me. I'd already written her three love letters. I hoped she'd write me back. Gordy wanted to come to the res and stay with us for a week or two. How crazy was that? And Roger heading to Eastern Washington University on a football scholarship had willed his basketball uniform to me. You're going to be a star, he said. So again, he went someplace where there was a bunch of hope, right? And how much hope does he have? Well, he's got lots of hope for his future. And then yesterday, I was sitting in the living room watching some nature show about honeybees when there was a knock on the door. Come in, I shouted, and Rowdy walked inside. Wow, I said. Yeah, he said. We'd always had such scintillating conversations. What are you doing here, I asked. I'm bored, he said. Last time I saw you, you tried to punch me, I said. I missed. I thought you were going to break my nose. I wanted to break your nose. You know, I said... It's probably not the best thing in the world to do, punching a hydro in the skull. Ah, shoot, he said. I couldn't give you any more brain damage. And do, like, do best friends talk this way to each other? They certainly might. I couldn't do any more damage than you already got. And besides, didn't I give you one concussion already? Yep. And three stitches in my forehead. Hey, man, I had nothing to do with those stitches. I only do concussions. I laughed. He laughed. I thought you hated me, I said. I do, he said, but I'm bored. So what? So you want to maybe shoot some hoops? For a second, I thought about saying no. I thought about telling him to bite my ass. I thought about making him apologize, but I couldn't. He was never going to change. Okay, so this is a really, really important um, realization that Arnold has. And it is a moment in your life when you really start to grow up, when you yourself have this realization that you cannot change anybody else and you are wasting your time if you try to. The only person actually that you can change is yourself. And we all know how hard that is. Yeah, so if you think about how hard it is to change yourself, you can imagine how impossible it is to change anybody else. So I guess he, he lets go of this idea of trying to change Rowdy in any way and he just accepts him for exactly who he is. 
And again, when you start to do this, you start to really grow up and, and be mature. It reminds me a little bit about how um, Arnold Jr. had to accept his father. His father was a drunk. His father has um, an alcohol addiction. But his father, he still loves his father. He accepts his father. He accepts that he's not going to change his father. And he doesn't allow himself to get emotionally involved in trying to change anybody else. Not his father, not Rowdy. He's growing up here. He's realizing that that's wasted energy, trying to change people. You have to let people be who they choose to be, who they are. And the only person you can change is yourself. Let's go, I said. We walked over to the courts behind the high school. Two old hoops with chain nets. We just shot lazy jumpers for a few minutes. We didn't talk. Didn't need to talk. We were basketball twins. Of course, Rowdy got hit. Hit 15 or 20 in a row. And I rebounded and kept passing the ball to him. Then I got hot. Sorry, hot, sorry. Of course, Rowdy got hot. Hit 15 or 20 in a row and I rebounded and kept passing the ball to him. Then I got hot. Hit 21 in a row and Rowdy rebounded for me. You wanna go one-on-one, -on -one? Rowdy asked? Yeah. You've never beaten me one-on-one, -on -one, he said. You pussy. Yeah, that's gonna change. Not today, he said. Maybe not today, I said, but someday. Your ball, he said, and passed it to me. I spun the rock in my hands. Where are you going to school next year, I asked. Where do you think, dumbass? Right here, where I've always been. You could come to Reardon with me. You already asked me that once. Yeah, but I asked you that a long time ago, before everything happened, before we knew stuff. So I'm asking you again. Come to Reardon with me. Rowdy breathed deeply for a second. I thought he was gonna cry. Really, I, I expected him to cry, but he didn't. You know, I was reading this book, he said. Wow, you were reading a book? I said, mock surprised. Eat me, he said, we laughed. So anyways, he said, I was reading this book about old time Indians, about how we used to be nomadic. Nomadic means wandering around following the game, following your food source, like the buffalo. Yeah, I said. So I looked up nomadic in the dictionary, and it means people who move around, who keep moving in search of food and water and grazing land. That sounds about right. Well, the thing is, I don't think Indians are nomadic anymore. Most Indians anyway. No, we're not. And I think he's talking realistically here, how, you know, uh, indigenous people don't move around um, of the Indian the Indians or the indigenous people used to have like winter camps and summer camps and they used to move to different camps you know for different reasons and so of course in our day and age indigenous people mostly just stay on their reserves um, so he said yeah I don't think Indians are nomadic anymore most Indians anyway no, we're not, I said. I'm not nomadic, Rowdy said. Hardly anybody on this res is nomadic. Except for you. You're the nomadic one. Whatever. No, I'm serious. I always knew you were going to leave. I always knew you were going to leave us behind and travel the world. Now, this is a big compliment coming from Rowdy, isn't it? I had this dream about you a few months ago. You were standing on the Great Wall of China. You looked happy. And I was happy for you. So this is not only a story about Junior realizing he can't change anybody else. It's also a story about Rowdy realizing he's not going to change Junior either. Junior is a mover and a shaker. He, he's an explorer. He wants to go on adventures. Whereas Rowdy just accepts the fact, that's not for me, right? But he gets to the point where he's happy for him. So their friendship has definitely evolved. 
and grown much healthier. Ravi didn't cry, but I did. You're an old time nomad, Rowdy said. You're going to keep moving all over the world in search of food and water and grazing land. That's pretty cool. I could barely talk. Thank you, I said. Yeah, Rowdy said. Just make sure you send me postcards, you asshole. From everywhere, I said. I would always love Rowdy, and I would always miss him, too. Just as I would always love and miss my grandmother, my big sister, and Eugene. Just as I would always love and miss my reservation and my tribe. I hope and prayed that they would someday, sorry, someday forgive me for leaving them. I hoped and prayed that I would someday forgive myself for leaving them. Ah, oh, man, Rowdy said, stop crying. Will we still know each other when we're old men? I asked. Who knows anything, Rowdy said, or asked. Then he threw me the ball. Now, quit your blubbering, he said, and play ball. I wiped my tears away, dribbled once, twice, and pulled up for a jumper. Rowdy and I played one-on-one -on -one for hours. We played until dark. We played until the streetlights lit up in the court. We played until the bats swooped down at our heads. We played until the moon was huge and golden and perfect in the dark sky. We didn't keep score. So one of the questions on the study guide is, what exactly does this last statement mean? Is it literal that they didn't keep score or is there something more figurative, some other deeper meaning to this. So I think it's pretty safe to say that we didn't keep score. I mean, of course, it could pertain to the actual game, right? The literal basketball game. But sometimes if you get into a lot of fights with somebody, um, people will say, well, we shouldn't keep, keep score of our fights. We can just forgive each other. So let's go of things we cannot control, forgive and move on. Junior could have said no, thought about telling him to bite my ass, but instead he said, yeah, let's go. Let's go play basketball. Let's move on. Let's forgive. Let's not stay stuck in our anger. He could have stayed stuck in his anger, but he decided to let it go, to just let go of things that he cannot control. He realizes he can't control Rowdy. He's not going to change him, right? Okay, so this whole idea of forgiving each other and not keeping score of who's right and who's wrong. And many people say that when you are able to do that, you actually can experience something called unconditional love. Loving somebody and caring about them regardless of how they treat you. When you get to this stage of being able to unconditionally love someone, that is the most mature level of love that you can develop. And it looks like Rowdy and Junior finally made it there. All right, that concludes our story, our um, novel study of The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. At this point, please return back to your study guides and begin to answer the, uh, the questions that we went over. Some of those questions you're gonna find on the quiz that is to follow for section six, sorry, section six. Good job, folks.